Hello everybody and welcome back to my channel. So today we are going to be discussing the case of Richard Hoagland and if that name sounds familiar, that is because I actually covered the case of Robert Hoagland just a few weeks ago. While researching his case, I kept finding articles about a man named Richard Hoagland who also has a very, very interesting story. I have never covered a case quite like this on my channel before, but you know, since I had already looked into it a lot while I was researching Robert's case, I figured I might as well go ahead and talk about it because it is a very interesting story. But before we get into the video, I just wanted to go ahead and give a massive thank you to my patrons, Connie, Rose, Wendy, Repo, Miser, I hope I'm saying that right, Richard, Yvette, and Laura. Thank you guys so, so much for joining the Patreon family. I cannot express enough how much i appreciate you guys and everything you do for me you guys are the reason that i am able to keep this channel afloat during everything that i do in my life so again thank you guys so so very much for your support so with all of that being said let's get right into today's video and again we are going to be discussing the disappearance and eventual reappearance of richard hoagland richard hoagland was known as the classic middle class average family man Richard met his wife, Linda Eisler, in the 1980s, and the two had an immediate connection. The two fell in love and were married in the 1980s. Since then, by all accounts, they had a very normal marriage. They got into some arguments, but that's pretty much expected when you are sharing your life with someone. The two moved to Indianapolis, Indiana after getting married and went on to have two sons together, Matthew and Douglas. Linda described Richard as just being an overall fun person to be around and someone she could share a laugh with and enjoyed being around. They lived in a pretty nice large home. They went on tons of exotic vacations and they seemed to have a very healthy marriage. However, at one point, Linda did notice that Richard began to pull away a little bit. He would sort of isolate himself in his room and kind of removed himself from a lot of the family conversations. He was acting a little bit differently than he normally had and was acting much more quiet and reserved than she was used to. She thought that maybe he was starting to struggle with depression or maybe he was having a really hard time at work. But still, she just chalked this up to him being stressed in his life and after all, that is a very normal part of being married with children and working and she didn't think too much of it at the time. Everyone goes through low points and struggles with their life and their mental health and their choices and Linda just thought that this was something that they were going to have to go through together and that this would pass eventually. Even Matthew and Douglas, their two children, didn't notice anything weird about his behaviors and had no idea that Linda and Richard were even going through anything whatsoever. However, that is when things just started to get more and more strange. Now, on February 10th, 1993, Linda and the family started the day as normal. She dropped off a seven-year-old Douglas off at school and then went to her job at the medical office just like any other day. She was nearing the end of her workday when around 4.45 p.m. she received a call from Richard while she was still at work. She was a little bit confused as to why he was calling her during the workday, seeing as how she was going to be seeing him and just a little bit in the evening after work. She asked him how his day was going and that is when he told her that he was actually going to head to the emergency room because he was not feeling well. So she just said to him, well, why don't you just wait and I'll go with you to the hospital? And he just said, no, I don't have time to wait. So he told her that he just was gonna go to the hospital without her. So from there, even though Linda was very worried and concerned about Richard, she just went on with the rest of her day as normal, finished up her shift at work, assuming that she would be home to see Richard shortly to see what was going on with him. So she went and picked up Douglas from school and returned home at around 5.45 p.m. that evening. She was expecting to see Richard back home with a clean bill of health, saying that he was okay and that it was just a health scare. However, when she got home, she realized that not only was Richard not home, but he had left their nine-year-old son, Matthew, home alone by himself all day. So at this point, she was understandably very concerned and started calling around to local hospitals to figure out which one Richard was at, but there was not a single hospital that reported any record of someone with the name Richard Hoagland being admitted. She was absolutely furious that Richard just 
left their son home alone all day like that, but she was also very worried that something serious happened to her husband because she figured that the only way that he would have left Matthew home alone all day is if something very serious happened. But then at the same time, she was confused and couldn't figure out why no one had any report of Richard being admitted to a hospital. Her mind was just swimming and she started to wonder if maybe there was some sort of accident on the way to the hospital and he was hurt so severely that the hospital just identified him as a John Doe at the time. So not knowing what else to do and after calling a bunch of different hospitals and not getting any answers, Linda searched around the home to see if there was anything out of place, to see if Richard took anything with him, to see if there was absolutely any indication of where he could have gone or what could have happened to him. But that's the thing that was very strange, was that there was absolutely nothing out of place. In fact, it was almost too perfect. He hadn't taken any clothes, no indication that he had packed any bags, his toothbrush was still in the proper place sitting in the bathroom unused, his passport was right where it should have been, and the biggest thing that stood out to Linda at this point was that Richard didn't even take his coat with him despite it being February and it being absolutely freezing outside. So in her head, she's trying to figure out what could have been so urgent that he didn't even take his coat with him in this freezing cold weather, yet he had the time to call her and, you know, he didn't sound like totally, you know, uncomprehensible. He didn't sound deathly ill on the phone, so she didn't know how this could have been some life-threatening illness that caused him to leave so abruptly. She really had no idea what to do at this point and all she could do was sit and wait and hope that nothing horrible had happened to her husband. However, it wouldn't be long before Linda was met with yet another blow. Only about an hour after she had gotten home, Richard actually called her again. He said, I can't live this life anymore. I feel like you would be better off without me. And before Linda could even get a word out, he just hung up the phone. Then a few hours after that, the same day, Richard called again and said, I don't wanna to go to jail. I'm never coming back. Once again, Linda didn't even have any time to respond before he hung up the phone. So of course, after this, there was a search done for Richard. His car was actually found abandoned a few days after he had made that third and final call to Linda. It was found at the Indianapolis airport, so Linda and police got into contact with several different airlines to have them search records to see if maybe Richard left the state or even the country. But they found no evidence whatsoever that anyone with that name had ever purchased a ticket. So at this point to Linda, it seemed very clear that something was going on and that Richard had just most likely chosen to up and leave his family, but she couldn't figure out how or why. Why would this man just up and leave the family that he so very much loved? And how was he able to just drop off the face of the earth without absolutely any sign of where he went? Like I said, his passport was still right where it should have been. He didn't take any clothes or pack any bags, so how could he have done all of this without taking anything with him? Over the next few days, Richard actually called Linda a few more times, on February 14th and again on February 15th. Each time he called, it was a collect call. Linda was eventually able to track down the location of where these calls were coming from, but this just left her even more confused. The first call was from Venezuela and the second call was made from Aruba. This just made things even more confusing, so police just started to get even more involved with investigating his disappearance and trying to figure out why he wanted to leave and where he was going. A few months passed without hearing another word from Richard until May of that year when Richard actually sent out a birthday card to his son Matthew, who was turning 10 that year. Then, a few months after that, he sent another birthday card with $50 in it to Douglas for his birthday. The card read, Doug, have a super birthday. You are a super boy. I love you and I miss you. Let your mom help you spend the money. You might want to put some away. Maybe sometime soon we will get to see each other. I bet I won't even know you. It's been so long. Mind your mother. Bye. Then signed dad on the other side of the card, which is just so absolutely freaking sad because he had every opportunity to just come back and see his boys, but he chose not to. 
this would be the very last time that Richard would contact his family ever again. So the more police became involved in searching for clues, the more they uncovered just what was really going on in Richard and Linda's marriage. Richard had been the main moneymaker in the family, so first and foremost, when he left his family with absolutely nothing, they were in complete financial ruin. They had no idea what they were going to do or how they were going to be able to afford their life or the house that they lived in. But not only that, but turns out that Richard had racked up an absolute mountain of debt that he had just left Linda with. Turns out he had been secretly maxing out a bunch of different credit cards without Linda knowing and without Linda having absolutely any way to pay them off. When he left, Linda was left with 26 maxed out credit card bills to pay. Also, right before he left, he took out a massive bank loan without Linda's knowledge and forged her signature on the document. There was even found to be hundreds of dollars in unpaid taxes that Richard had somehow avoided paying. Richard had kind of secretly been struggling financially and Linda had absolutely no idea about any of it. At this point, it was clear that not only did Richard abandon his family, but he ran up massive amounts of debts before doing so, knowing that there was absolutely no way Linda was going to be able to pay off any of it. So because of all of this, Linda actually filed for divorce so that she would no longer have to pay all of his unpaid debts. So at the end, the judge granted the divorce and ordered Richard to pay off the 26 credit cards, the unpaid taxes, and several other outstanding debts that the two had joined. But even still, the family was absolutely devastated. For so long, they thought, you know, okay, this won't last very long. He will be back and we can put all of this behind us, but he never came back. He stopped making any contact with them whatsoever. The family was completely broken. He left them with absolutely nothing. Linda was no longer able to continue making mortgage payments. She could no longer afford her car payments. She was trying her best to continue raising her boys, but had no idea how she was going to do so. She was terrified for what her future held and was absolutely heartbroken that the man that she thought she loved, the father of her children, just up and left them so carelessly. Then to make matters even worse, as police continued their investigation, they actually started to look into Linda. Now, of course, the entire time she had been speaking to police and she told them that she had absolutely no idea where he could be. The entire time, she never wavered from her original story and had given absolutely no indication that she knew anything. However, police were not totally convinced of her innocence and thought, Maybe she actually knew where he was hiding and that the two had planned this entire thing together. Investigators were pretty confident at this point that Linda was in on the plan and that she had actually planned on taking the boys to Marion County, Indiana to meet up with Richard where he had been hiding. Linda had no idea why police thought she might be involved until even more information about her husband came out that shocked her once again. Turns out, even before Richard had skipped town, he was already being investigated as a part of a theft case. So police were already looking into him before he even left. So of course, him leaving was a giant red flag and even furthered the suspicion that Richard was an even bigger player in this entire theft case that they had been originally investigating him for. So investigators theorized that he skipped town to get away from this investigation and that Linda and the kids would soon be following right behind him. They thought that there was absolutely no way that Linda did not know about Richard's financial situation. They told her that they believed that Richard was involved in some sort of drug trafficking and that she knew about it and that she was involved in hiding Richard and helping him stay under the radar. But again, Linda truly had had no idea what was going on and was getting very frustrated that police wouldn't stop questioning her. It was clear that she was suffering from the very beginning from him leaving. She was absolutely drowning in bills and she was doing everything she possibly could to convince police that she had nothing to do with it. 
her financial problems actually became so severe that she threatened repossession. She got to the point where she had no choice but to file for bankruptcy. This is obviously something that Linda did not want to do, but she didn't want her kids to end up homeless and there was absolutely no way that Linda was going to be able to pick herself back up from these financial ruins. Eventually, she did end up moving herself and her two boys back into her parents' house. Again, this was not something that Linda ever wanted to do or ever thought she would have to do, but she was happy that at least she had the security of a roof over her and her son's heads. Now, for a while, Linda's biggest concerns were money, but after moving into her parents' house and actually finding a minute to just relax and breathe, things just kept getting stranger and stranger. So, for a period of about six months, Linda started to feel as if she was being followed and as if her family was being watched. She started to notice that people would follow her around in public. She kept seeing the same people over and over and over again everywhere she went. Random cars that she didn't recognize started parking near the home. She started to notice that her mail appeared to be opened and then resealed before she got to it. She then started to notice that there were a bunch of random items around the home that were just out of place. She initially thought that maybe the kids were just moving stuff around in the home, but this thought quickly went away when she noticed that Things were moving around even in drawers that the kids did not have access to. She was absolutely terrified and this fear was confirmed when Linda's father actually found a recording device attached to Linda's phone line. Linda didn't know what to think. Now, she knew that she was a part of a police investigation and they thought that maybe these weird things were just a part of them investigating her, trying to find out if there were any clues indicating that she was communicating with Richard, whether it be by phone or by mail. But this didn't even make sense because police are not technically legally allowed to go into someone's house and just move things around and tap their phone lines. So Linda started to suspect that maybe Richard became involved in some very scary people and maybe Richard had done them wrong. So she thought that maybe these people were just trying to come back and get revenge on his family or maybe they were trying to figure out where he was hiding by searching the family's home if they thought that Linda was in on it. She had no way of knowing what kind of legal activity that Richard could be involved in and what he had gotten himself into. She got so paranoid that she actually ended up relocating with her sons and her parents to a new home in Mixcordsville, Indiana. All of her bills were transferred to her parents' names, hoping that they wouldn't be traced back to her. They had chosen a house in a relatively recluse area and even had Matthew and Douglas wait for and catch the school bus by a friend's home in case they were being watched, hoping that whoever was watching them would not be able to figure out exactly which home was theirs. For the following six months, her and her family stayed in hiding until things seemed to calm down, but for years to come, the paranoia never went away. She always felt uneasy and she always felt like she was being watched. She was so incredibly thankful to her parents because she said that they were the only reason she was able to stay afloat this entire time through everything. She had so much going on in her life, obviously, and her parents were able to help financially. And I'm sure that they helped with the kids too to take off the burden of having to watch them all the time and giving her time to herself to just relax and unwind and allow herself to just not be in a constant state of anxiety and stress. Eventually, she was able to get her life sort of back together and she did get remarried. Then by 2003, after 10 years of being missing and not in contact with anybody, Richard Hoagland was actually declared legally dead. Matthew grew up and got remarried and had children of his own, but for Douglas, the road was not so easy. Douglas actually started using drugs in early high school and he had broken his hand and got addicted to the narcotics that he was prescribed. After this, he was in and out of jail for years because of his drug use. He later admitted that he had very low self-esteem and very low self-worth after his dad left, which of course he's going to. The whole family continued on with their lives the best that they could, despite knowing that their own father abandoned them and never wanted to see them ever again. They tried to just go on with their lives as normally as possible, 
until everything completely changed 23 years later in 2016. So in 2016, Linda had actually received a phone call from a detective named Anthony Cardillo of the Pasco County Sheriff's Department in Florida. He asked Linda, do you know who Richard Hoagland is? And Linda was completely shocked to be hearing that name again after so many years. At first she thought, oh my God, police are investigating me again. What could it be this time? Until they told her that Richard had actually been found alive and he was being held in police custody for identity fraud. And this is when 59 year old Linda finally received the answers that she had been waiting over two decades for. After years of investigating, police were able to finally figure out exactly what was going on with Richard this entire time. So after leaving in 1993, Richard went down to Florida and he was eventually able to rent an efficiency apartment from an older gentleman named Edward Samsky. So at this point, Richard had been living with Edward in this apartment. And around the time that Richard had moved in, Edward was grieving the loss of his son, 33-year-old Terry Samsky, who had passed away two years prior in 1991 in an accident while at sea for his job as a fisherman. Edward had spent a lot of time just pouring his heart out to Richard, recounting all of the good memories that he had with his son, telling him about his son and everything that he was into every single day. However, rather than being a shoulder to cry on and a decent human being, Richard actually eventually found Terry Samsky's death certificate and stole it to create an identity for himself. So using the death certificate, he was able to obtain a birth certificate from Ohio. I don't know exactly how that works or how that's even possible, but after getting the birth certificate, he was able to apply for a driver's license by mail for Alabama and then used the Alabama license to obtain a Florida driver's license. Then once he had the Florida's driver's license, he was able to establish an entire new life under the name Terry Samansky. So it really seemed like Richard had just hit the jackpot by somehow randomly finding this man. Terry himself, the real Terry, was originally from Cleveland, Ohio, and then he moved to Florida to become a fisherman. The way that Terry had lived his entire life made it very easy for Richard to acquire his identity. He didn't have much of a paper trail at all. He had no children and he was never married. So that meant that he had no wedding photos, he didn't have a marriage license, and he had no one to come looking for him when they realized that Terry's records were you know, active after he should have died. The entire time that Richard lived with Edward, he just took advantage of him and figured out a way to create his new life. He wasted no time after fleeing from Indianapolis to get remarried to a woman named Mary Hickman in 1995. The two settled down in a town called, and I know I'm probably going to butcher this, but I think it's called Zephyr Hills in Pasco County. He worked a bunch of different odd jobs and, you know, bought a bunch of properties to rent them out and, you know, was a landlord and he got a pilot's license and he even had a new son with his new wife. He was actually discovered using Terry's real identity after the real Terry's nephew started browsing around on Ancestry.com in 2013. This nephew found records of a living man named Terry Szymanski living in Central Florida. He also discovered the pilot's license under the same name, but this nephew knew that the real Terry had died in 1991, so he immediately thought that someone could have stolen his identity. However, even though this nephew was very worried and he knew that the dead guy obviously couldn't have gotten a pilot's license, the family was very afraid of coming forward right away in fear that this imposter would come after them and harm them. It was actually three years before he actually went to police with this information. After this information was brought forward, 63-year-old Richard Hoagland was arrested in July of 2016 after 23 years of living under the radar. When Detective Cardillo knocked on Richard's door, he told him that his name was Terry Szymanski. He showed him his driver's license and gave him the social security number that he had. But then the detective showed him Terry's death certificate. At this point, the second family found out and they were very, very shocked. 
Mary went out to the attic and started searching around and lo and behold, she was able to find his real identification documents in a briefcase in the attic. After being confronted with all of this evidence, Richard had finally admitted to what he had done and was taken into police custody. Of course, the biggest question was why? Why did Richard leave his life? At one point, because of what Richard had told Lori on the phone right after he had left about not wanting to go to jail, it was thought that he maybe owed millions of dollars for some illegal activity that he was involved in, and Lori thought maybe he was wanted by the FBI. Experts even thought that it was very possible that he was in some sort of very, very deep financial trouble and thought that the only way that he could have gotten out of it was if they thought he was dead. After all, most people don't steal someone's identity just to start a new life. It was usually because of money, according to experts, but that is not what Richard said at all. He told police that the reason he left was simply to get away from Lori. And investigators found absolutely nothing linking Richard to the FBI. They found no criminal record and it seemed as if Richard truly just wanted to leave his life for whatever reason. Obviously, he wanted to leave so badly that he chose to never see his sons ever again and just let them live in squalor. Obviously, Lori was completely confused and blindsided because she truly had no idea why her husband of 20 years wanted to leave so badly that he chose never to see his sons ever again. Douglas was actually in jail serving an eight year prison sentence when he found out that his father was found. News headlines actually came out about a man being found 20 years later and he immediately recognized the picture as being his father. Originally, Richard went to jail and was being held on a $25,000 bond. They wanted to charge him for all of his original crimes and for the massive amount of debts that he failed to pay, the cost of divorce proceedings, and many other charges that he was originally charged with. However, because that just seems how this case goes and how Richard's luck seems to have it, they weren't actually able to charge him with any of these because of the statute of limitations. Instead, they were only able to charge him with stealing a dead man's identity. Lori was very upset, but she felt so bad for Richard's second family. She knew what it felt like to have her family completely torn apart by this man, and he was ruining yet another family. Mary was worried about the properties that the two had owned together and all of the assets they had together, but from what I was able to gather, it seemed that Mary was able to hold on to most of it, even though, you know, Terry wasn't his real name. Richard was was a living, breathing person who signed all of these documents. Experts were also very surprised with how long Richard was able to keep all of this up. Things like taxes, social security, credit reports, bank accounts, and government benefits are usually used and are a way to prevent identity theft. However, Richard didn't have a credit card. He used his new wife's social security number for all of their taxes. This would make his paper trail much smaller and pretty much completely non-existent. But as we know, this stuff always catches up with you eventually. Richard was only sentenced to two years for the impersonation and identity theft and is now a free man, which is just absolutely crazy to me given the amount of pain and suffering both of these families went through. Linda eventually took him back to court and actually sued him for $1.8 million in unpaid child support and she won the case, but of course, who knows if this will ever eventually be paid because his other wife has all these other assets to deal with with their divorce. Either way, at the end of the day, Richard never truly apologized to anyone, not for ruining his two families, not for the identity theft, nothing. Thankfully, Douglas is out of jail and it seems like he is picking himself back up and getting his life back together. Matthew is married and has children of his own. They saw everything that their father did and now they have a perfect example of what not to do. And to this day, we still have absolutely no idea why Richard chose to leave. It is clear to me that he actually is, I guess, a family man, obviously not a very good one. He is obviously very selfish and a complete and total narcissist, but he did go on to get remarried and have another kid. No one forced him to do that, but he chose to. Like I said, he claimed that he literally just left so that he could get away from Lori, but his children truly believe that he must have been involved in the wrong people and owed people money and left out of fear for that. 
They refused to believe that their father just left them under crippling debt and made them suffer so severely just because they didn't want to see Lori. But I don't know. People have done a lot worse, like killing their wife just to get away from them and avoid paying child support. So while it's not something that anyone wants to completely accept, I kind of believe him. I think he was an absolute coward. I think that he couldn't face his wife and kids and tell them to their faces that he wanted to leave. So he just took out a bunch of money and left without saying anything. It's easy to destroy someone's life and not have a care in the world when you don't have to see the pain or suffering in their faces. I think he is selfish, I think he's a narcissist, and I don't think he cares about anyone but himself. I am not exactly sure what he's up to these days, but I imagine he's probably living a pretty dull life. I don't see his family wanting to have any communication with him, and everyone knows what he did, so I don't imagine another woman wanting to become involved in him. But that is all I have for today's video. It is nice to have a little bit of a lighter case you know, once in a while where we aren't necessarily talking about someone dying or something like that. Obviously, this is not a pleasant case and Richard ruined so many people's lives, but at the end of the day, at least the family was able to get some much needed closure. So now I want to know what you guys think. I am really looking forward to hearing your guys' thoughts on why you think that Richard actually left his family. Do you think that he was in some sort of very deep financial trouble? Do you think he really did just want to leave his ex-wife, Lori, for whatever reason? please let me know your thoughts in the comments below. If you like this video, please make sure to go ahead and leave this video a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. I put out new true crime and mystery videos every single week. Also, don't forget to check out my Twitter and Instagram, both will be linked down below. And if you have absolutely any case suggestions, please make sure to go ahead and send them to my email at rachelshannoncases at gmail.com. With that, I hope you guys have a fantastic week and I hope to see you next time. Bye.